Bonjour. Bonjour. Comment ça va? Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. That's the extent of my French. We're done. <laughs> I know you know more. Well, you, 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 un peu. You, you told me un peu. So you listened to, to a full class in French, so I guess you know a little more than that. I listened to some of your classes in French, and if I listened carefully, I could make out more than half of it. Yeah. Because um, you know the subject also. So. Cause, well, okay, so maybe we should explain. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a story that Shalom Aleichem met Lahavdil Mark Twain. Shalom Aleichem came to America. And Shalom Aleichem, the famous uh, Yiddish writer. So he came to America and he met Mark Twain. And he said to Mark Twain, he said, you know, they say about me that I'm the Jewish Mark Twain. Mark Twain said to Shalom Aleichem, you know, it's funny, they say about me that I'm the American Shalom Aleichem. Uh-huh. Okay. So those watching out in uh, internet land or listening on in podcast land, today our guest is Rabbi Yair Elbaz from not just France, not just Paris, Paris. How do they say it? Paris, Paris. Yeah. yeah, but the suburb of Paris called Le Valois Perret. Yeah, yeah exactly. Did they say it? Yeah, 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 yeah. You got it Which right. Is a very Jewish neighborhood on the outskirts of Paris. And some would say that he's the French Chase Taub, but I would <laughs> I say I am the American <laughs> Yair Elbaz. That's what I would say. You like that? Uh, I would love to see the one saying that I'm the, the French Chase Taub. Okay. Very, uh, yeah. But you've taken some of the stuff that I've done and you did it in of course, French. Of course. Yeah, okay. Yeah, tell yeah, t- yeah. tell I, I, I started with the. Um, I started with the Shara Bitochen classes because there's. Uh, I when I started learning it myself, I liked it a lot, and I thought it it it, it brought a lot to me and uh, to people around me. I started uh, I started learning with people, and I said I'm going to share it with people. Now it's it's a text that. Uh, in Chabad circles and in, in the yeshivas, we never learned such a text. You know, right. it's like. It's not like preparing a maim or a sikh or or, um, or tanya. It's it's a whole different style. Right. So when I started learning You're it, saying even if you would take a mimer that you haven't studied before, but the style is familiar. Yeah. And yeah. this is a whole different style. <clears throat> yeah. And I had yeah. a very hard time to you know like to figure how to teach it and how to translate words. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like so I started listening to your classes. Some of them I even listened like. Five to ten times, mm-hmm. <laughs> double speed. Uh, always, of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, depends which classes. Sometimes yeah. you, you're able to to listen on double speed, and you use that as uh, your template. Yeah, yeah. And then you I have notes. Then you gave the class in French. I have notes in my phone. You have notes in French. You write in, your notes in, in French, either in Hebrew or French uh-huh. or whatever. Mm-hmm. So more mostly in okay. Hebrew. It's now, faster. How do you speak English so well that you can listen to my classes in double speed? I I was I studied in America for four or five years. Okay. Um, I was in uh, Morristown and then uh, and then Miami, where I met you. Uh, for That's the first what you time. just reminded me before yeah. we started yeah. filming that we met yeah. in Miami many years ago. How many years yeah. ago was that? Ten years ago? Mm, close to ten years. And you were learning smicha. You were getting by Rabbi Frankfurter. By Rabbi I was, Frankfurter. I was, I was a shliach for the French community. There's a big French community in Miami, and Rabbi right. Frankfurter Miami is Beach. Uh, Miami Beach. Yeah. Right. And, and there's a shul there. What's it called? The shul Stiebel, there. They have Stiebel. And yeah. by Frankfurter, then, because it's already, he already moved to, to somewhere else, uh, had his yeshiva, his mm-hmm. the smicha program. And he had, he had two parts in the yeshiva. He mm-hmm. had a smicha program and a program for, for French Bachrim to, to right. help him with, the, with his actions uh, with the right. French community. So you were learning smicha and also helping out with outreach during the day. Yeah. 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 How many Bachrim? How many... In my year, there was like, uh, I think, 10, 10, 12. And they were all French? Bachram? No, half of them were French. Uh-huh. We had four French Bachrim and uh-huh. six, uh, six American, Australian, uh-huh. uh, had a nice mix. I remember we had a, I, I, he brought me there for a speaking engagement. It was like yeah. the week when all the New Yorkers come down to Miami Beach. So we had like mm-hmm. a whole New York crowd there. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was like Borough Park, but it was like Miami Beach, like a big uh, from Brooklyn crowd there. 
And then I remember afterwards, maybe I was hanging out with you guys upstairs or something. We fabrenged, I think. Yeah, I, I, upstairs. It's, it's from been the, such a long time. There was an upstairs, though, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Downstairs is the shul. Right. It's a karastir shul. You know, it's like yeah. karastir is like satma. Yeah. And it's, it was a base chabad and the, <laughs> yeah. and the satma the shul. So it was interesting. The satma rebbe came once in, when, that, in that shul. When you were there? Uh, yeah, yeah, that year. Yeah. Oh, wow. You remember? And, yeah, of course. Yeah. So of course. I'm sure he, he had spoke. a big crowd. Yeah, we had also, uh, for Fabringen once, uh, Rabbi Wolfson. And, uh, it's a destination uh, shul. It's yeah. like a known place. That's yeah. like where you go for your your minion. Yeah. 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 So where are you? I mean, you're from France, but where are you from in France? Um, I, I grew up in, the, in one of the Paris suburbs, which is called Orly. People know it. Uh, oh, the airport. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. But because there's there's two airports. There's one which is Charles de Gaulle. Like right. President. Right. CDG. CDG. CDG is right. uh, CDG's in New York. No. Ah, Charles de Gaulle. No, Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle. Yeah, CDG. Yeah, I just CDG. didn't. CDG. When I heard it in, uh, when I hear it in CD, English. When I hear CDG, I think about Charles de Gaulle. CDG. No, CDG. CDG. Sound, How do you say uh, JFK in French? JFK. Okay, so I say mm-hmm. CDG. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so exactly, yeah. I'm doing the same thing back to you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I was never, I never flew through CDG. I almost did. You went to France? No, I went to Belgium. Belgium. And you know where I landed? And you get to know which airline I took when I tell you. I landed at the airport called Charleroi. You ever heard of it? Charleroi, yeah. My brother is the, is the rabbi there. Really? Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. So which airline did I take? I can't tell. It's I a dinky little airport. It doesn't have normal. I, I never went there. Oh, you never went there because you went to uh, BRU. BRU. I never went to, to Belgium. Oh, you never went to. Okay. BRU is Brussels, which is a nice big <laughs> airport. Uh, Chalowa is a dinky little airport. Um, and I flew there on Ryanair. Ah, Ryan you know Ryanair? Ryanair? Of course. Of the course. peanuts cost more than the ticket. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's like, you know, like Spirit in America? Yeah, yeah, This yeah. is more. It's <laughs> worse. I, I flew, I flew through Spirit. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you get like a $10 ticket. In French, we say that you, you, some, some uh, what's it called? I don't know the word in English. Economie. So say, en français. Econ- Economie. Economie. We're not, we're not rich Economie. enough. Economie. We're not rich enough yeah. to make such economy. Economy is like when you try to save. But right. yeah, we're not rich enough we to don't make have, those yeah, savings. We can't afford such savings. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so you're from Orly. Yeah. I'll say it with so my it's American Paris. Accent. Like when I tell yeah. people where do you come from, I say I'm from Paris because people right. don't know the suburbs. Right. But uh, yeah, I grew up there. Mm-hmm. And I was in um, Beskrivko school in France. Uh, it's like a cheder, but they, they had also a limud de chayl. And then I went to Brunois. Right. How far Brunois. is that from, from Paris? From Paris, it's like uh, an hour, about an hour. Mm-hmm. From my house, it was like 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. That's a famous Five. yeshiva, famous yeah, Chabad of course, yeshiva. Of course. When was it founded? In the 40s, like right after the war? I think when the chassidim came from Russia, they, uh, they started the yeshiva. I think so, we're uh, close to 80 years. I, I'm the, not sure family. how much you know about this history, but I... I I would like to speak about this. I was in remember Ro- when you gave the cor- the uh, the class on the letters. So, you had, yeah, you had a- and there was a letter that, that Rebbe wrote regarding the uh, base Rifka in in France. That's yeah, right. So base Rifka is right next to Brunois. It's like two right. Cities and I which asked are- you how to pronounce the name. What was yeah, the name again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I still can't yeah. pronounce it. <laughs> but um, I was in Williamsburg. Well, I was in. Uh, I went to Crown Heights for Shabbos. And then I did Taluch. I went with Kuti Feldman. I walked to Williamsburg, the end of Shabbos, and I was in Williamsburg. And I told him a story about a French guy. I'll tell you the story in a second about the French guy that I told in Williamsburg of the Satmar Chassidim. But I said to them, do you guys have Frenchies? Like, they were like, no, they don't have Frenchies. And I realized that Frenchies is like a big Lubavitcher phenomenon. Like most groups don't have – we have a disproportionate number of French, French people, people in the The Rebbe had a big uh, So that's connection. what I want to talk about, the connection. The Rebbe was in France for, for many years, and the mm-hmm. Rebbe went back to France, even after he came to America, to, to mm-hmm. get his mother, Rebbe Tzadkana. That's where we know how uh, the, the, which day the Rebbe's birthday is. 
Right, that's the how Rebbe yeah. said uh, to the Chassidim. Uh, it's, right, uh, it's, you should ask him to Febrang for his yeah, birthday. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and also many Chassidim were in France, and it's it's sort of I guess for Lubavitch it was a sort of like a halfway point coming out of Russia, but not mm-hmm. all the way. To, I mean, from France, many people ended up going on to America or to Eretz Yisrael. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rabbi Leibel Shapiro, who a lot of people know, yeah, was sure. born in Paris. See, I didn't know that. <laughs> but it doesn't even shock me now that you tell me because so many Lubavitcher yeah. families were in Paris for a short period of time. Um, there's a famous letter that Ebba wrote um, about Nifne, about collecting money yeah. to support yeah. the Maimed. Rebbe, Maimed money, and he writes it to Shlomo Chaim Kesselman, who everyone associates with Eretz Yisrael, with Kfar Chabad, but the letter was written to Shlomo Chaim when he was in Paris. Yeah. And he says, and I'm going to CC Ben Sheshemtov, who people associate with, with England, but he was also living in Paris at, at that, that time. time yeah. yeah. The, the famous picture, I think, uh, when the Rebbe Fabian in Paris, does the ben, I think... My Ben Tzvi Shemtev is in there in the picture. I think I'm not sure. So, do you have any insight into? I guess I mean, there's a lot of ways to ask about this. The effect that it had on France, like the effect that so much Lubavitch presence in France had on France, and also like reverse, the effect that France had on Lubavitcher wow. culture. Uh, like, okay, let me. Let, that's a big question. Let me <laughs> let me make it more specific. Okay. Um, to what extent, or to in what ways can you give me examples of how the history of Lubavitch in France? Oh, we should mention, by the way, because the history of Lubavitch in France goes back even further. Yeah. I, I, I think, maybe you could tell me it goes even further back, but we know that Rebbe Marash came to France. Oh, yeah, there's a famous story with the Alter Rebbe and Napoleon. That uh, well, that Napoleon against, came to him. Against. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because Napoleon was invading but the, Russia. In the in the, in the, in the, the there was one sicha dedicated to to the to the, the France. famous Tsarfas yeah. Uh, sicha, yeah. yeah. And there, the Rebbe starts all the way from the beginning, from uh, from right. Vayeshev, uh, uh, Vayishlach, Vayishlach. Vayishlach also. Yeah. The Rebbe yeah. started talking about uh, yeah. about France and about uh, its its shaykhs with. Uh, okay, so you know what? Let, let's let's back up. You're right. You're right. The the France. Relationship with Lubavitch goes back to the Alter Rebbe. The Napoleon, Napoleon was invading Russia. It was going. It was. It was unstoppable. It was going across Europe. Uh, most of the Talmidei Magid, the, the disciples of the Mezitcher Magid, were actually in favor of Napoleon. Um, Napoleon was promising liberation, emancipation. Um, was the first one to give human rights to the uh, to the French uh, to the French Jews. Right. So that was considered a sort mm-hmm. of uh, hopeful. Uh, thing even institutions that Napoleon uh, people don't even don't really know about these people outside of France but the Jewish institutions in France until today like there's a big institution which is called the the consistoire it's like uh, like the federation Jewish federation in America it's like the same style I don't know really much about the Jewish federation in America but I know that in France uh, one of the most important institutions which is the Consistoire was founded by uh, by Napoleon. So uh, <laughs> people yeah. don't. You're saying the average French Jew has no clue that that it was instituted by right. Napoleon. Uh, like those a who no, question. no, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. right. So the Alter Rebbe uniquely was very against Napoleon. Exactly, and he felt it would be devastating because even though materially it would be uh, there would be relief for the Jews, but spiritually it would lead to assimilation. Mm-hmm. So therefore. The, the Alter Rebbe not only spiritually supported the Tsar, but materially he had he had Chassidim who were spies, and he was uh, mm-hmm. he was part of uh, supporting the Russian war effort. Recently, they yeah. discovered, and um, I have I have to look for it, but I have it somewhere. Um, um, pictures and uh, PDFs of a, of a library in France where they see that Napole- the, the French army and Napoleon and all of his people mm-hmm. went to Lubavitch. Liadi, like all the, uh, I don't know if Mezibosh was there, but like all the Chassidish cities. Right. Like, and we know Lubavitch until today is right. not such a big city. I don't not know about all. Liadi. Right. But, but, but it's, these are not it's, destinations. You know, like you, sometimes yeah. you talk to people about uh, Lubavitch and the history and the Alter Rebbe Napoleon. They're like looking at you like, okay. <laughs> That's like, it's uh, very uh, cute. Uh, You're embellishing. Uh, to make yeah, it, to involve you, like, your little subculture. You really think Napoleon right. had a clue about who the Alter right. Rebbe was? Right. And 
it's interesting. Okay, we as Hasidim, we don't need that because we have yeah. uh, our books of history. But but uh, recently they they discovered that it's documented that we have papers about uh, Napoleon went through these uh, these cities. We know all the story about the uh, pantoffel. Uh, that's the, the word the in slippers. French. It's the sleepers. Okay. Pantoffels in French. Pantoffel. Oh, so it's a cognate. It's similar. Yeah, it's uh, a yeah. very close. Yeah, the slippers. Right, the Alter yeah. Um went back because he back. forgot his slippers. Right. One of them. And, and the, the story that we have is that Napoleon wanted some personal items that had belonged yeah. to the Alter Rebbe to do yeah. to do black magic. There's the famous story that the Alter Rebbe went back and he wanted to burn down the whole house. He burnt down the whole house because he didn't want that the that Napoleon should have any of his personal effects. Now, my, my understanding of it, I could look up the sources again, but my understanding of it was that why did the why did Napoleon want an item that belonged to Rabbi Barachovich, which was how he referred to mm-hmm. the Alter Rebbe? Because if you have a, a possession of somebody spiritually, that's like a, a way to to get access to them. Mm-hmm. Look, you see with something that the Rebbe a physical object that the Rebbe gave, whether it was dollars or it was tanyas mm-hmm. or kuntres and pamphlets coins, that the Rebbe yeah. gave, you know, that the coin, something that Rebbe gives, you see it has a connection to the Rebbe. So I guess that could also be used the other way, God forbid, in a negative way. And of that's course. Yeah, yeah. what yeah. I understood was Napoleon's uh, aim there. But, okay, but let's talk about this famous sicha where the Rebbe basically told the whole history of Lubavitch in France, going back to the antagonism between Napoleon and the Alter Rebbe. And then... Just, just to... Yeah. to uh, th- that week, there was, uh, there was a group from the issue. Uh, from Brunois. From Brunois. Yeah. I think that's... I'm not sure, but I think that's when they presented the building, the new building. Okay. Which is today already the old building. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Because <laughs> they, they remade... You know the Alt Neuschul in Prague? Yeah. So it's it's the new alt noise the right. the old, old new shul. So right. so there's uh, there's this uh, building which is very old which right. belonged to Monsieur because the the Shiva of Brunois is on the street Monsieur which, okay. which was the brother of one of the French kings. Okay. So it's it's like uh, it's it's you, you can't destroy it. So they had it's a historical to, to, landmark. Yeah. So uh-huh. they so had to protective. destroy everything inside uh-huh. and rebuild the inside. Uh-huh. So that's a we have our alt uh, uh-huh. yeah, your <laughs> old new yeah. school, yeah. yeah, or building school, Shiva. Yeah, uh-huh. and then they presented it to one of the. I think uh, Rabbi Garavich went uh, mm-hmm. before the Rebbe, and you has you have this picture of him uh, showing the new the new building. So they went, they were there, and that's what, and there was also people from uh, from Canada, okay, which speak French. Uh, right. You know, like uh, the the Moroccans, they all uh, they all speak right. French. I think Rabbi right. Raskin was there that Shabbos. I'm not sure, but. Mm-hmm. I know that uh, in the in the Sikha you could see that the Rebbe speaks also to the to the people to the group who came from Canada, and uh-huh. um, so the Rebbe started talking about France, like we because right. there was a big French group yeah, there, yeah, 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 right. But in this Sikha, the Rebbe goes through the history, mm-hmm. going back to Napoleon, and he sets it up as like an antagonistic relationship mm-hmm. that the Alter Rebbe was very against Napoleon. And then sort of comes up to the present day and says, but now France, and the Rebbe explains what France represents. But for shorthand right now, I'll just say France. The Rebbe says what France represents has changed and now it's no longer a threat. I'll I'll use my own translation for it. It is now a tool that can be used in order to prepare the world for Mashiach. Yeah. Yeah, the, and even more, the Rebbe says that France is going to be an example for other people, for other communities around the world. France is a uh, is special, and okay. and, uh, and Moshiach is going to start from France also. Now, France is not just a, ge- a geographical location. Mm-hmm. France is an idea. You probably don't even realize. You know why they say a guest of a mile that a guest of a vile zet of a mile. A guest for a little while sees a mile because you're probably too close to it. You, you see things that you, uh, I, I, you yeah. don't probably realize what France means because you're steeped in it. You come from it. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. Okay. What does France represent? 
Well, first of all, it represents a certain amount of culture. Uh, a friend of mine, um, I'll give a shout out, Chaim Marcus uh, from L.A., who mentioned me on one of his podcasts, so I'll mention him here on my podcast. Um, he told me he was speaking to Sammy Rohr, all of a shalom. And uh, Sammy was originally, I think, from Switzerland. Um, later, of course, he lived in Colombia. Uh, I forget the setting, but he heard Sammy have a conversation. He picked up the, the phone, he was speaking in French. And so he spoke a lot of languages. Um, Yiddish and, and German and Spanish, obviously, and English. So uh, Chaim says to Sammy, oh, you speak French? And Sammy Rohr says to Chaim, I wasn't there. Chaim just described me. He thought this was just so rich. He says Sammy responds to him like, almost like taken aback by the question. He says, all educated people speak, speak French. French. <laughs> you know that... <laughs> it used to be back in the days. Uh, even the, you, you see, the, you, you ever see the the Rebbe's passport? Yeah, from Russia. Yeah, it's in French. So, so the, the czars used to speak French in in their house. I, I always heard that that the, that the all Russian the, aristocracy spoke French. Yeah. That's right. That, that's that's not cool. only the Russian aristocracy. In a, in a lot of uh, country, that's the way it was. There's an expression, lingua franca, which ironically is not French. I think it's Latin, but it, lingua franca means French language. But it's a it's an idiom for like the language that people actually. It's like the gold standard. The way like today, maybe you would say English, although it's not considered so cultured. But English is like the language you can do business in in any country. So up until rel relatively re relatively recently, French was like when when governments would get together and they would have like a peace treaty. And they, what do you, what language did they speak? The language of diplomacy mm -hmm. was French. Mm -hmm. The language of philosophy was French. The language of medicine was French. Uh, that, that was the language. Yeah. yeah. Then English came and uh, okay. Then English came and uh, probably mostly because of the American influence and uh, the American. You, you, see, you see it even in, in in the inside of Chabad. You always have like in seven seventy. You'll have a big fabring and there's gonna be a big table for Americans, yeah. Israelis, yeah. and then for French. Now, there's a big community also in Argentina, in the, right. in, in, in in many you other never places. Never see the Spanish table. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, French people right. have to have their they own. Have their table. Like, yeah. yeah. That's all, for so, sure. Yeah. For sure. And you feel them, and uh, you always hear about them. So, this this idea of France. It's like, a, it's a hush of a thing. It's a, there's certain prominence. France, right. And represents culture and a certain um, gold standard, I might even say, of like, of like culture. But specifically, and this is the way that Rebbe described it in the Sicha we're referring to, as representative of certain um, cultural and political values that are very closely associated with the Enlightenment and modernity. They say that in 1973, when they flew, there was a big group from France that came, with Rabbi Mula Azimov. Uh, the Rebbe started singing the French uh, anthem. That's yeah, anthem, anthem, yeah. yeah. Marseillaise. Uh, yeah, Marseillaise. And people were, people were talking about it, like the, the, the French people were like, one of them said, I think the Rebbe is singing the Marseillaise. Right, people. Like, uh, His friend, like, what are you saying? Right, it'd be and like it's like the Rebbe singing the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, it'd be weird. It, it, yeah, yeah. And, and then the Rebbe asked the French people to to sing the Marseillaise. I think they they sang it once, all of it in French, <laughs> like the whole thing. And then uh, the, throughout the night, all of the Chassidim, which were not French, right, they didn't know the song. It was like. That's what. That's how I heard the story. Right. Um, you had like a lot of groups with a French right. guy in the middle teaching, <laughs> teaching everyone this, uh -huh. the, the teaching, song, teaching the Russians uh, yeah. the French song, which yeah. is fine. Turnabout is fair play because there are plenty of songs that the Russians took. You know, there's a lot of Chabad Nagunim that we think of as Nagunim, yeah. which are Soviet marches. Yeah. 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 Until oh, yeah. today, you, you, you yeah. hear it in yeah. whatever in stores or yeah, you could. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, or uh, uh, die, 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 die. It's a Soviet march. Really? Yeah, sure. Um, 
But at any rate, the Rebbe took this, La that's how you're mm-hmm. pronouncing it. Mm-hmm. My French is terrible, but that's that. That's not, is that the French national anthem or? Yeah, yeah, until today. A few years afterwards, or, yeah. or, the, or could be even that year, um, the, they, they changed the anthem. Right. And then they put it back. <laughs> they put it back. <laughs> put it back. It's interesting. Uh-huh. And the Rebbe speaks about it in that Sikha. Right. That right. it had an impact on the, on the song. because it, it was, was like co-opting it, taking it, owning it, which is mm-hmm. there's a precedent for as well because the Alt Rebbe took a song from Napoleon. Yeah, Napoleon's march. He could hear the, he said he could hear the march. The da 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 and the the Alt Rebbe says, "I said nigun nitzachen." It's a song of uh, victory, but in the end, it's going to be didan nitzach. It's going to be our victory. Yeah. So he co-opted that song and made it so it became a Hasidic song. So just like the Alt Rebbe took Napoleon's march, the Rebbe took the Masayes and made it uh, a Hasidic song. Many many people. The the French anthem is very hard. It's like the words are very. Brutal. I, I remember when the, uh, I was a counselor in camp. Yeah. We went around the city to, to interview people. Right. To ask, you know, like you ask people questions on the street. Yeah. I don't know the, the name for it, for the game. Like the whole, it's like a city game. Right. You go all around the city and you get things from uh, from stores. Scavenger and hunt. Music, yeah. In English, it's called scavenger hunt. Okay. okay. So we How do you call it someone. in French? How do you call it? Uh, you don't Enquête en ville. I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so we went to a guy and we asked him, can you sing for us the, the Marseillaise? Just a random guy. And yeah, it was a old, very old guy. He said, I never sing it. So in he principle. Said, he said, because it's very brutal. Mm-hmm. And I even went to jail when I was in, in the army. Like, I don't know, you know, the army jail, not the, the right. real jail. Because, right. because I didn't want to sing it because it's very... It's really? very brutal. Yeah. So the one guy that you asked to sing it. Yeah. And in the middle of the song, it says, L'étendard sanglant okay. élevé. It's like a, a, something with full, some, some clothes full with blood is, is, uh, right. is up. You know, like it's, it's a war song. Right. You know? So yeah. uh, it, it's, it's interesting to see a guy who was in the army and right. he refused to, he didn't want right. to sing it. Yeah. You know, just, uh, just interesting. Like, we don't imagine what the what the song really is. Yeah. Uh, in some Chabad houses, in all of Chabad houses, uh, we sing it Shabbos morning, and yeah, that, but, some neighbors are so happy to hear it. Like, okay, yeah. you guys are uh, are real. Uh, <laughs> you guys have the value as uh, of France. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. But the, the the value specifically that France represented from the time of the Alter Rebbe. Which the Alter Rebbe really, you're talking about the late 1700s, <coughs> early 1800s. I mean, the Alter Rebbe passed away during the Napoleonic Wars. In fact, mm-hmm. the Napoleonic Wars were, were a cause, at least uh, from a natural perspective of, of his passing. So um, what that represents is a, as the Alter Rebbe identified it, a very dangerous influence on the mm-hmm. world stage. It was a threat to Jewish values. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems... What, what I think the, you, you, yeah. have to, you have to explain that because some people might uh, look at it and say, okay, you see, Napoleon's instituted a lot of... He did a lot of good things for the, right. for the, um, for the French Jews. Why is the Alter Rebbe not grateful? And he said, he said a very... Uh, the, one of the sentences, which is even now in, in the, in the, in the political uh, debates, we hear about that, uh, yeah. that thing, this... Uh, I'm not gonna go into it, but like just to say something, there was a uh, one of even right one now, of, currently. Yeah, yeah. One of Napoleon has a, a very, very strong impact on French uh, uh, culture. Uh, there was one of them which said, "I'm giving everything to the Jews as citizens, but nothing to the Jews as a nation." Mm. So Wait, Napoleon one, said this. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Meaning as private Na, individuals? Not Napoleon. Not Napoleon. No. I, someone who was called Claire Montonner. I, I, I think he, he was in the government. I don't remember exactly. Say again slowly. Claire Montonner. I think that's maybe that's what uh, Alter Rebbe meant. Um, we're going to turn the Jews into regular regular citizens. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to strip big... them of their cultural identity, their national identity. Yeah. Yeah. 
So in a way, it's like uh, getting into people's personal lives, which mm -hmm. is uh, connected with uh, with Yiddishkeit, with uh, religion, Judaism, and maybe that's uh, maybe that's the idea. I I, th I think it's that, and it's maybe even more than that. It's not only just stripping Jews of because you're asking like why wouldn't I mentioned before that most of the Al Rebbe's peers were very happy for Napoleon. Yeah to be victorious and they were religious leaders it wasn't like they weren't concerned with religion in fact they thought maybe it would even I, I assume they thought it would promote religious freedom and the al Rebbe was very very against, it. against yeah. it very concerned about it so I don't think we have to go very deeply into it to explain why the al Rebbe was against it what I think is remarkable is why seven generations later the Rebbe said he's for it. Mm -hmm. Why was the Alt Rebbe against it? It was a different time. Because yeah. it was, it was, a, and in that time, the forces of enlightenment, emancipation. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah. we're coming to you, Chuat soon. Yeah? Okay, yeah, it's the, the Rebbe's mission is, and the Rebbe says it in the in my Basiligani Tavshin Dalif. Yeah, the Rebbe says there, our mission in our generation is to bring the Shechin Alamato. So at the time of the Alter Rebbe, the Shechina was still, I guess, I guess, uh, not ready to come into such uh, in, into such uh, w the, the country wasn't uh, wasn't ready. But uh, you see, from the beginning, and the Rebbe was there also. So the Rebbe felt more connected to the to the um, to France. You're saying because the Rebbe told people yeah. to French people that I know. Um, someone asked him, I need to work in, I think he was working in a bank and he needed to have a wig to work. The Rebbe told them which store to go to, on which street. Mm. And there you'll find a, a wig and he's going to be able to, not a wig, not for, not for women, for, for men, just because he, he can't wear a yarmulke. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, the Rebbe was very connected uh, to France. Mm -hmm. uh, he showed uh, he, he, the, the Lishka in France. I don't know if you heard what yeah, that is. Sure. By yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they would pay for the ticket for the French people to come. This was special to the to the to, to France. No other country had that. The Rebbe would pay for for, but, for but them I'm, to come. I'm going to give you pushback here. Yeah. Like, and I'm going to say like this. You say because you you're, you're saying this. You're, you're too French here. You're saying, see, the Rebbe had such a connection to France, and that's why. I, I, but listen, I, I only tell it. you what I what I heard. But, but I, I, I'll I, give you. I'm, 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 not, give you I'm not old enough. No, I'm sure the stories are all true. <laughs> what I'm saying is, I don't think you can explain the Rebbe's view on France just because the Rebbe lived there. And I, and I'll give you the best proof. The Rebbe also lived in Germany. Yeah, but there was no Jews in Germany at that time. I'm saying that the, France is is different, not just because the Rebbe lived there. France represents something, and I think that's what that sicha is, is talking about. And that's why about. the Rebbe went to live there. And maybe because, that's even uh -huh, why, uh -huh. who knows, who can fathom why the Rebbe needed to be in that place. Um, but there's, it's obvious that France represents something very important. And the transformation of France represents something much bigger. In other words, the fact that France represents a force of evil in the time of the Alte Rebbe, and seven generations later in the time of, of, of the Rebbe, France is like, like you said, an example for the world. France represents like the ultimate in goodness. There was a change. There was a transformation. And I, I don't know if it was a transformation in France so much as a transformation in the world. That in the time of the Alte Rebbe, I'll use the word openness. The openness of Western liberal values was a systemic threat to the spiritual survival of the Jewish people. Seven generations later, this is how I take this sicha, the Rebbe is saying that the openness afforded by Western liberal values is no longer a threat to us, but some, it's an energy that can be harnessed. And it can be a force for good. So what I'm telling you is, yes, France, but it's not just France. France represents something, you know, <laughs> the, 
they, they say the French imitated the Americans because the Americans had a revolution first, so then the French said, hey, it could be done. But the truth is, in a lot of ways, the Americans, in, 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 they imitated the French because the founding fathers, who were they influenced by? is the French thinkers, the, the Rousseau and Voltaire and all the enlightenment thinkers about individual liberty. When you talk about Western liberal values, what you're talking about really is it's exactly what you said. I'll give you everything as citizens and nothing as a, as a people. Western liberal values is about individuality. That's a chiddush. Mm. That's a novel because for thousands... Human rights. France is called le pays des droits de l'homme. Uh, the, 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 the country of uh, humans' right, because they were the ones... Uh, oh, and the, that's something that France prides themselves. Yeah. This is the country yeah. of human rights. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But individual human rights. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of, co uh, of course. But what I'm saying <laughs> is... Noir, human rights is... Uh, but that's the whole point, is for thousands of years, the way that human beings sort of organized... Was is, is in I have a question. I have, yeah. to, I, have to, I have a question yeah. to ask yeah. you. I'm yeah, yeah. sorry to, to yeah. cut you, but you always say in your videos, yeah. I don't like, you know, like you're associated with mental health all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. And you always say like, uh, by the way, you want to learn about the five languages of love. Right. You, you don't have to read the book. Right. You just, I didn't read the book. You don't, you watch the TED talk. Oh, actually, you don't even have to watch the TED talk. Right. You just read the description. Of the TED Talk, right. Okay. And then you know what you need to know. Now I see that you know a lot about... Uh, right, but uh, I French don't know history. a lot. This is, so, my knowledge is this deep. So how do you, where do you take it from? If you don't uh, read, if you don't read uh, uh, um, I secular ha, stuff. I, I have a, my mind is magnetic. It just pulls in information. But I only have depth in very few areas. So, but, I have a lot of breadth, which is good for like a 30 second hit and run conversation. I can't go any deeper than this. You speak about Rousseau and Voltaire. I mean, the, you, I never, I never, uh, whatever. I never read those books, <laughs> okay. but I know no, they no, had don't. an influence. But someone, when someone says like, where did they have the, 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 the inspiration from? If not for Rousseau and Voltaire and, yeah. uh, you know, like all the, all the French uh, thinkers. Yeah. Well, how do you know about that? I told you, I, I know. All, the, all I, of that is in the description of. I uh, know a little <laughs> bit about a lot of things. Okay. I'm very good at breadth. So you read the Wikipedia's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, sometimes you go to a bookstore and just read the back of the book, the description, you know, you know uh -huh. what's in there. Okay. So what I'm saying is that France isn't just a geographical country in Western Europe called France. France represents an ideology, which had a huge impact way beyond its borders during the era of modernity, mm -hmm. okay? France's biggest export in the past 300 years is culture. No question. And, and by culture, I don't mean opera, ballet, or maybe that too, but I mean, or opera is Italian, but I don't mean ballet, I mean political thought. West, fashion. Fashion as well, yeah, who can forget? Fashion, of course, but... I mean, I'm not the best example for French fashion, but because I, I, I hold in my... Uh... <laughs> the biggest export of France is political thought. People don't realize that modern political thinking is all French. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you something even more. There's a big misnomer in, in contemporary political discourse of conservatism and liberalism. Um, it's a misnomer because the truth is everyone today are liberals. Yeah. Yeah. It's like talking about far wing in Israel. It's like there's, there's no like. <laughs> everyone is a, even the conservatives believe in individual rights. So everyone is liberal. And there's left and there's right, which by the way is also a French term. Where does left and left wing right wing come from? It comes from France. You know why? They actually would sit that way. Yeah, they people would, who, who who liked better the. The royal uh, institutions. Right. The loyalists said, uh, they, would sit on the right side of the yeah. room. And then the people who are more like the Robespierre type, the, the, they were the, the, what are they called? They the Jacobeans. The they would sit on the, on the left. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Fran France's main export is political thought. And specifically, the most dominant political thought of the past few hundred years, which is Western liberal democracy. And to the extent that... 
So if yeah. that exists on the ch- on the on the on the secular level, it yeah. has to exist also on the on the spiritual level. Yeah, you know, that's, why, what, that's what that's I'm saying. That's why. Th- th- yeah, because that that was one of the Rebbe's uh, main line throughout the years. I mean, I'm not such a such an expert, but I know I know one thing. There's uh, that line that the Rebbe always says: if that's the way, uh, materially speaking, it has to be also spiritually speaking. And really, it's the opposite. It because comes it's from spiritual, it. right? It's also material, so right. uh, it has to have also a spiritual uh, force. In fact, you see in many places in France, you have uh, Balatesfes, uh, Rashi, the, the um, you have many, 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 many places in France. You have um, uh, Torah scholars that that were there, right? Going back a thousand years, yeah. yeah. But let's speak specifically about this phenomenon that is a real novel idea. It's so big, it's so ubiquitous that we don't even recognize it because it's so it's so omnipresent, it becomes like the air that we breathe and we don't, we don't even, we take, and therefore we take it for granted. I'm saying the entire idea of individual rights is a French concept I'm saying it was enormously successful. It changed the entire world. I'm saying before the modern era, there was no such concept. Societies were collectivist societies. And until today, you have certain holdouts who are collectivist societies. Uh, a lot of them, like in, 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 for instance, totalitarian governments like North Korea, China. Um, but Western countries, modern countries are all individualistic society, especially America, who took that to the ultimate uh, extreme of everything is about the individual. Like, you can't tell me what to do. I'm an individual, and it's about me. It's about my rights, and and don't, 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 don't tread on me, and don't get, in the, don't get in the way of my rights. I think... As as you mentioned, like when Napoleon or his or his representatives saying, "We'll give the Jews everything as citizens. We'll give them nothing as a people," the Al Rebbe was saying that threat of putting individual in identity above collective identity is is too dangerous right now. But in my opinion, what did the Rebbe do? He took that idea of individuality and and brought out the holiness of it. You see in the Rebbe's Torah, this is a common theme of Vayakel Pekude. Coming up to these parshas very soon. Vayakel Pekude. Sometimes they're separate parshas, very often they're joined. The Rebbe would often remark about the paradox, the oxymoron. Vayakel means to gather. Pekude means individualized counting. So one's collective, one is individual. How do you put them together? And the Rebbe would always bring out that really... The group strengthens the individual. The individual strengthens the group. It's not, it's not a contradiction. I believe, I'm telling you this as a French person. Well, you're not a French, but you're a Jewish person from France that you might not even realize. It's always a discussion. Are you Jewish-French or French-Jewish? Is that a real discussion? Of course. Because in, in America, they don't have, it's only, um, we say American Jewish-American or American-Jewish. American Jewish. I never heard the discussion in America. I, I always heard American Jews. I've heard Jews. the question, who are you more loyal to, America or Israel? That question I've heard. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, you might not realize this, but French doesn't just mean French. French means modernity. It means Western culture in general. It means individual rights. That's mm-hmm. what French means. Mm-hmm. There was a time when that kind of thinking was a threat to Judaism. The Rebbe said, now is a time where that not only is no longer a threat, but that's essential to our work in perfecting the world. How do you see that in the Rebbe's Torah? I mean, the, 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 the concept of, of uh, individuality. Um, yeah. I, I'm... Uh, where do I, I see don't it? really, uh, you know, the Rebbe always says it has to be. It has, it has to, to be understood. Torah. No, it has to be understood from. Uh, oh, for I'm anashim s- pshutim. Anashim pshutim. Uh, <laughs> okay, simple people. Okay, so for instance, <clears throat> last week Parshas Bay, we had the Carbon Pesach, yeah, the, the Passover sacrifice, which was 
oh, you know what? We had a little, it was cool. We had a little French last week. Rashi does a lot of French. Yeah. Today's yeah. Chomish Chitas, by the way, there's a whole sentence in French. Really? Yeah. I'll pull it up in a second. But last week, it was interesting. Rashi said, Pesach means jumping. He said, also means to step. Like in French, and he used a French word, which in old French at least means to step, like a pace. There's a, there's a French chumash that they made, and every word in yeah. old French is there explained, like it's it's the real word. How the Rashi, the Rashi, I don't want to get off the point, but the Rashi French to you is like me reading like uh, Chaucer. I don't know who Chaucer is. <laughs> it's like it's old English. I can't, you, I can't I can't I can't understand half the words. Uh, sometimes I understand the words and sometimes yeah. not. It, uh, it depends. You know, uh, even if you take a book from a hundred years ago, right? Some of the books, if if it's really um, sophisticated French, yeah. it's hard to understand. Uh huh. So even a hundred like years way, ago, the way the way newspapers in France are writing their articles today, yeah, is not the same way they used to write even. 60, 70 years ago. Uh huh. Okay, so Rashi is. So even, uh, it's. Uh, okay, but. French is a very. Uh, it's. All right, but the, but the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, it's interesting. That's the first sacrifice that the Jewish people brought. And in fact, according to some opinions, the first mitzvah. You're going to say, Achoydesh Azel Lechem is the first mitzvah, the, the lunar calendar, but the Kliyakr says, no, the lunar calendar was only to know the date of the Passover sacrifice. So the first mitzvah, at least according to one opinion, was the Passover sacrifice. But for sure, the first sacrifice was the Passover sacrifice. So the Rebbe says, therefore, it has universal, eternal symbolism because it's like the first. And, you know, without getting into the whole elaborate explanation of the temple sacrifices, but there are two general kinds of temple sacrifices. There's something called a korban sibir, a korban yachid. Uh-huh. Oh, you see where I'm going. All okay. right. I was, I was okay. uh, waiting for it. Right. <laughs> There's a, a communal offering. A communal offering is like, uh, for instance, every day there's a tomid in the morning and a tomid in the afternoon. And that's no individual brings that. That's brought on behalf of the entire community. It's paid for by communal funds. They levied a, a flat tax to pay for it. Then there are individual offerings. For instance, a person commits a sin. He wants to atone for it. He brings a chatas. Or he, he wants to show thanks for something. He brings a korban toida. Those are individual offerings. A communal offering can and must be brought even on Shabbos and Yom Tov. Yeah. An individual offering, they'd say, come back Sunday. You don't bring it on Shabbos or Yom Tov. There's a whole issue that happened when Erev Pesach, which is the day of the Korban Pesach, fell on Shabbos. Yeah. The whole, yeah. Famous story with Hillel. That's how Hillel rose to prominence because they were confounded by that dilemma and Hillel was the one who solved it for them and told them that Korban Pesach is funny. See, is it an individual offering or is it a, a communal offering? It has aspects of both. It's like a communal offering because there's a date for it when everybody has to do it. But it's like an individual offering because every individual has to do it. Uh-huh. So they couldn't figure out which one it is. For example, when everyone is tummy, when everyone is impure. Right. So we can still do it because it's a communal... Uh... Right, right. Yeah. So... In the end, he, he figured out that the aspect of it that is a uh, communal offering makes it that you do bring it on Shabbos. At any rate, so the Rebbe says it's very interesting. The very first, some say mitzvah, but everyone would agree the first sacrifice the Jewish people brought was this weird hybrid of communal and individual. So the Rebbe says that really is, sums up all of Judaism. All of Judaism is a hybrid of communal and individual. And the Rebbe gives examples. And the example, it's a powerful example. How do we see... You know, when COVID happens, uh, many, many rabbis said, um, Judaism is not all about synagogue. Right. Like, it's about... Uh, and, and that's why, by the way, Korban Pesach was, was in the home. The first Korban Pesach, there was no Beis HaMikdash. So where did yeah. they do it? In Mitzrayim, they did it in their homes. They did it in their homes, right? It was done in the home. 
That's also a classic debate about individual, communal, public health, individual rights. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And this is not just something that the Jews are discussing. This is, I'm telling you, the main, like, cultural... The main subject in, today, in yes, today's society. Yes. Okay. And the Rebbe's answer is, the paradox, individual and collective. And this is such a French thing. It's such a French thing. The individual side of it, at least, is such a French concept. So human rights, country of human rights. Okay. And the Rebbe is saying, yes, we're all about individual rights. Okay. But you have to see, a healthy individual has to be, has to be mavatal itself. I'll use the Hebrew term, the Hasidic term. A healthy individual has to surrender its identity to a collective. Okay. But we're not collectivists. We also say, conversely, a healthy collective has to surrender its identity to the individual. I'm, I'm going to say something. I don't know if you're going to like it. Say it. I think everyone will agree with what you said. It's like uh, in French we say, uh, c'est comme enfoncer une porte ouverte. When, when a door is already open and you want to, right. you know, it, it's already open. Right. Who wouldn't agree that you have to have a balance between communal community, uh, city, right. country, and your personal life. Who wouldn't question agree? Is, question is, where is the, where's the limit between... Right. Uh, so, um, well, first of all, the fact that you're saying who wouldn't agree itself, stop a second and realize that that, that, that requires a little bit of uh, appreciation. Because if we were having this conversation two, three hundred years ago, it wouldn't be so clear. That you have to have a, a personal life? If you would no. speak to, to Karl Marx and no. you wouldn't agree? No, so it's, Marx is only 150 years ago. But if you would, you would, you would ask people uh, 300 years ago when, when everything was the divine right of kings, they would, we would say, what about an individual? Forget the individual. You die for your country and then that's it. Uh -huh. Okay. It, 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 was, it was understood. We're living in an age where... In a certain <laughs> sense, people knew even then that you have a personal life for your family. Okay, uh, uh, sometimes there's a war and then you, you need to go to the war. But then the, the most part of your life, you're, you're with your family, you're with your personal life. My understanding is in the, in the ancient world, people's identity was basically concentric circles of, of group identity. So, you know, maybe... They the, belong to the king. They had a picture of the king in the house. They, uh, they were very... Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the, I see the what king saying, is yeah. like the furthest out. So maybe my Maybe my I town, can't even realize because then, I'm... Yeah. Right. So what, what I'm saying is that the idea that an individual has value, that there's ever a dilemma between individual and collective, individual versus collective, what are you talking about? The greater good. We always go with the greater mm -hmm. good. When would we ever sacrifice an individual? I mean, when would mm -hmm. we ever sacrifice a collective for an individual? Never. Mm -hmm. It's always the collective. The collective wins. Let the collective win. For the individual will have to sacrifice for the collective. So you know what proof the Rebbe uses? And the French, if they knew this, they would have loved this one. The Rebbe uses a proof from Torah that the collective has to sacrifice itself for the individual. From Rambam, when he talks about the laws of Kiddush Hashem, of sacrificing your life to sanctify God's name. So he brings there a law that a group of Jews are besieged by hostile non-Jews, and they tell, the non-Jews tell the Jews, Tnu lonu echod mikem. Take one of you, give over one of you to us, And if you don't give one of you to us to kill, we're going to kill all of you. They shouldn't give. And the Ramam says they shouldn't give. Yeah, it's okay. It's a, yeah. I remember the first time I learned it, I was like, whoa, that's, wow. Yeah. And you read that and you're like, if any people follows that law, they're not going to survive very long. And what do you see? That the Jewish people who follow that law, and it wasn't just a thought experiment. Unfortunately, throughout history, and in our, in our brutal history, we've had countless times where that law was actually put into practice. And it's counterintuitive. You would think any nation who would follow that law wouldn't survive for long, and yet the nation that followed that law <laughs> outlasted... The most. Yeah, yeah, they outlasted all of their tormentors. So that's an example where the individual can outweigh the collective. And that's a very French idea. I'm trying to figure how, how it's very French. 
Um, Human rights, uh, freedom of uh, freedom of uh, speech. Yeah, you're allowed to think and to express what you're yeah. thinking, even though the Americans took it even further. In a lot of ways, the Americans took the French ideas and and brought them to their ultimate extreme. And by the way, that's also you know the American culture of rugged individualism. That's the term for it, rugged individualism. What's rugged individualism? Rugged, like a tough guy, a cowboy riding out into the sunset all by himself. The Rebbe capitalized on that. The whole institution of shlichus. It's a very, yeah, because the old Russian way, I mean, Chabad comes from Russia, white Russia, but Russia. You know, like people always think that uh, 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 Chabad, okay, maybe you don't hear that in America, but in, in France, people think Chabad is is being helped by uh, New York. Right. I just I just opened a Chabad house like a few months ago. Where can we donate? So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Where can we donate? Um, on, on the, there's, a, there's a platform called Aloudon. Spell it in English for us. A L L O D O N S. Okay. That F R. Okay. Slash J L ninety two nine two. J L ninety two. That's yeah. your specific. Yeah, it's the name of the of the organization. Okay. And and when I open, like I I have to to tell people all the time, like we don't get helped by uh, New York right. or even in Paris. I mean, right. uh, uh, you have uh, um, they you central were organizations yeah. we're gonna, who are going to, to put out uh, uh, pamphlets and, you know, like uh, things to, to help right. us. They like, give you resources, yeah. materials, but no one's giving you money. Yeah. 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 So, You're on your own. Uh, of course. You're of course. on your own. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same so idea. So the old Russian way of yeah. bitl, I'll use the Hasidic term. Mm -hmm. Bittel meant you're a garnished, you're a nobody, you're a nothing. Mm -hmm. And you should be you should be grateful that you get to be a nothing. Mm -hmm. The rabbi took Chsidisha Bittel and he said, You want you want to be bottle, you want to be totally surrendered? The ultimate way, go out and be a something. Go out on your own. Well, you're not really alone. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> but why are you not alone? You know the famous yeah. uh, the famous uh, line the rabbi told uh, Rabbi Steinsalz. Which he one? goes in front of the Rebbe, yeah. and the Rebbe tells him, like, uh, yeah. and he says, no, uh -huh. you yeah. did a good impression. And, and, <laughs> and uh, when I was in yeshiva, I used to, yeah. uh, to, to copy the, the rabbis. Yeah. But, uh, that's a long time ago. Oh, you're good with uh, impressions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I can't do you, but uh -huh. no, you can't. <laughs> the, that was the first thing I was going to ask. <laughs> and uh, and the Rebbe tells him, "I, I, I eat this come on you're, 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 you're never alone. It's, it's a, it's a strong thing." But the, the Rebbe sent, sent out couples, right? Couples alone. It's, it's an interesting idea, connect, connecting to, to all, uh, to all of that uh, thing. When, when there was, uh, there was the attacks. In uh, in Paris, you, I don't know if you remember, like f probably seven years ago. You know when they killed oh, kids yeah. out of a school. Yeah. Um, then they the the government put soldiers. Right. There, there, there were th no. I don't think. One second. There was a kosher store attacked. Mm -hmm. I think that's when they sent soldiers right. to all of the synagogues, every every shul. Right. Every Chabad house, every Jewish institution had soldiers in front of the right. thing. That people even said, like, okay, we right away recognize that it's a French, that it's a Jewish place because you have, <laughs> you have soldiers in front of it. Right. And Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Avram Shemtov from uh, from Washington, uh, no, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, yeah. And he came to Paris. He came to Favreng, and he said, "Now we are closing the 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 circle. On boucle, okay. le, on ferme la boucle." He French. spoke in French? No, he doesn't speak French. Okay. Um, That's what I was going to and, <laughs> and he said, basically, the same soldiers who went to fight the Alter Rebbe are now protecting Jewish institutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chabad institutions are also in those, uh, in those institutions. It's interesting. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's not connected to France and to... Yeah, I bet you it is. It, we'll find the connection, yeah. <laughs> it's on Bitochen. Oh, Bitochen, okay. Yeah. You, you, you know... Um, you know Rabbi Dubruskin? Ever heard of him? Rabbi Menachem Dubruskin. He also makes uh, videos on Shurim. He's on the Project Lekutasichis. Ever heard of him? Oh, yeah. I think he was a yeah, Chaser. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also. 
because it gives very good classes. Yeah. He, he, has, he has a podcast, yeah. very interesting podcast on, on, he has like questions. It's more like the Chabad address, the Chabad uh, crowd. Has like uh, on Aveda Satfila, on many, many subjects. Very interesting. And he had something on Bitochen. And I always, uh, I, I spoke to my brother once about Bitochen and he said, if Bitochen works, so if I believe that I'm going to win a million dollar, I'm, I'm really going to get it. Yeah. Why not? Does that work? So he gave an answer. Okay. You want to yeah. hear the answer? Yeah, wanna, you want to give your answer? No, first. no, no, no. I want to hear his answer. <laughs> he said, because the, the guy who is making, I don't remember the, 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 the second rabbi in the podcast, uh, he interviews them all the time. He asks them questions. Uh-huh. He's doing a great job. And he told them like, okay, so if let's push the, let's push the idea. If I want to win a million dollar to the lottery, if I have bitachen, am I going to get it? And by the Wuskin said, um, like, you're not supposed to ask for things that are unnatural, like um, um, above, like, you don't need a million dollar. Once I put on my status, uh, you don't need a, I had a small video in the middle of a show. Uh-huh. I said, like, you don't need a million dollar. Someone answered, no, you need, I need much more. <laughs> 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 but that's what he answered. He said, um, you, you, Bitochen works only for things you really need, only for, for uh, basic, um, not not basic, but like what you need, what what what's really what's really important for you, mm-hmm. not things that are, you know, like uh, winning the the, the lottery. Mm-hmm. What do you say about uh, that question and the answer? Yeah, but there are people who do need a million dollars, and they're. I'm talking about people, uh, r- regular people, and, uh, and, and and there are people who not people on business who have uh, who f- for well, which I'm a million about dollars are, who who easily have a million dollar a year budget to have to raise a million dollars a year. Yeah, that's not even such a big budget. Plenty of people I know, yeah, plenty I, of people, I, yeah, 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 and of they use Bitochen in order to raise that million dollars. Okay. For your personal use, not for okay. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Right. Not, uh, not not on the on the community. You know, I know people who personally when Shluchim need a million dollars, they don't need it for themselves. They need it for the community. Right. They and need it, it for the right. for the institutions. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I I might say that if you really really believe that you need it, uh, and you're convinced of it, and you're aligned with that, then it, then it would work. Even in the lottery. You're not allowed to dictate to Hashem how he gives you the million dollars. Oh, it has to come through the lottery. What do you care how it comes? There's a chassan who came here. There's a, there's a, we have a group of French, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of teenagers who learn with me in, uh, in Levalois. And uh, one of them said to me, I'm supposed to be to get married in Cheshven. Mm-hmm. Now I tell him, you have to get married uh, earlier. And he says, I don't have the money. So he started giving me all excuses and answers. I told him, listen, you're, you're here by the Rebbe. Mm-hmm. Go to the Rebbe and ask the Rebbe for whatever amount you need to get right. married as fast as possible. And, uh, and he went. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, when you need it, but when you don't need it. So, yeah. So your answer is? Need is a relative term. Can you explain more? You know, when you're younger and you have to buy your first house, it seems like a lot of money to come up with for a down payment. And then you get older and you're like, that's a monthly credit card bill. (laughs) What I thought was a down payment on my first house Mm -hmm. is for one month of a credit card bill 15 Mm -hmm. years later. And, and you start to realize, you know, and I think the money that I'm dealing with now is big. And there are people dealing with seven, eight figures on a daily basis. Everything's relative. We're, we're, I think we're very small-minded. A million dollars isn't even a lot of money. <laughs> now, for a guy who thinks it is, then I don't think his betochen that he'll have a million dollars will work. But a guy who doesn't even think it's a lot of money, not because he's a fool, but because... To the contrary, he understands how, uh, how he would use that money. 
He's aligned with it. When I mean he's aligned with it, I mean it has to be congruent. It can't be that there's, it can't be it's just something you're saying, even something you're thinking. It has to be, be talking, you can't, you can't, there's an expression in English, you can't lie a prayer. You can't lie a prayer. Who are you, you fooling? You can't fake it. You can't right. fake it. So betochen has to be totally congruent and aligned. So if there's a party that knows, well, this is far-fetched and it's really superfluous and I don't need it, but I'm going to keep saying in my mind over and over again, I believe, I believe, who are you fooling? You believe. You don't really believe. Because if in your heart of hearts, if you would say what you really believe, my you don't believe. My always says this, tell a story. I don't know if you told it in the in the betochen classes, in the Shara betochen. He says like this, there was once a rabbi there was once a, no, uh, uh, someone in the, someone who used to, to have a good job and he went to a class and he heard about Bitochen and uh, he went to buy a ticket and he bought the ticket and he went home. And he a said, lottery ticket. I'm not, a lottery ticket, yeah. And he said, I'm not, uh, I'm not working anymore because I'm going to win the lottery. So his wife said, okay, let's wait. And uh, one week went by, two weeks, three weeks. She couldn't handle it, so she went to the rabbi and she told him, listen, you gave a class and my husband is now working for three weeks already. Mm -hmm. He said, tell him to come over. So he went and the rabbi told him, uh, how much are you supposed to be winning at this lottery ticket? Right. He said, two million. He said, okay, I'm ready to pay one million and you give me the ticket. Mm -hmm. So the guy, t the guy said, uh, he started thinking and then he said, okay, of course, of course I'm ready. <laughs> so, 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 you don't you don't really believe you don't really you don't believe really or you wouldn't believe. sell out so yeah, cheap yeah, yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> oh that's good so, yeah that's good you, you, you told it no, no no i'm hearing it for the first time i love it uh -huh. so it's from my shva yeah. my uh, rabbi azula he's a, he's a he has a big chabad house in the he has a central chabad house in the city and uh at the beginning of this year we opened a small a small place the other side of the city. The city is feeling every every other day. There's a new Jewish family coming. So where are they uh, coming from? Um, the cities in France, in which it's uh, harder to to settle for for a Jewish uh, for a Jewish family. Basically, so most uh, of the Jewish population in France is sort of converging into Paris it's, now. It's, it's getting more concentrated. Uh, in uh, well, just like in America, really, uh -huh. you know, like you have uh, New York and uh, Florida, and uh, yeah, <laughs> right. No, it's like there's two places in Paris. There's like yeah. uh, Le Valois and around uh -huh. there's Neuilly, the 16th district of Paris, 17th, mm -hmm. and then the other side completely, which is 12, mm -hmm. 13, Charenton. It's like mm -hmm. the second. Uh, and people are coming to to say the there's places, like four thousand uh -huh. Jews in the 17th district of Paris. Uh -huh. You realize four thousand. Yeah. yeah. It's, a crazy number. You have a lot of restaurants and uh, uh -huh. so it's becoming more concentrated. Store. Yeah. And what's happening with some of the like outlying, not small communities, they're big cities, but like you know, like Lyon or Nice in the south. Like I guess what's I, happening with the Jewish population? Dwindling. I guess many of them I, I have like people from Lyon, from from Lyon, from uh from all over France, but it's cheaper to to, to settle there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of uh there's, there's kosher restaurants and kosher mm -hmm. stores. I guess it's like half of them are going to Paris or to other places. And uh, there's also people who are emigrating to who make Aliyah, who go to Israel. Right. right. And uh, yeah, many people come back. We don't speak about that. No. <laughs> In America, we hear all the French left. They all went to Israel. Yeah, it's not true. Yeah, you have. <laughs> I mean, you have places like Netanyahu. Uh -huh. Yeah, you have to you have to have a yeah, you have to have a French passport to go there because uh -huh. it's yeah it's you, you really French. feel in France you go to you yeah. go into the streets you yeah. feel, you feel like you're in France but uh, yeah many many people come back I, I'm not saying you shouldn't make Aliyah but like right. before you make it make sure you're actually able to do it mm -hmm. it's uh, it's harder French is a very social country you get a lot of help from the government if you have a big family. Okay, get an apartment for the government, so you know, like it's a. Uh, oh, you mean you social? You don't mean like people socializing? You mean there's a lot of social programs? Yeah, 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 right. Which is also part of like the Western liberal, yeah, enlightened modern uh, ideology. Yeah. So, hold on a second. One second. One second. One second. It's, it's over.
is recording, but I don't have a lot of data left on the card. <sighs> so what's your advice for me? Okay, hold on a second. Okay. What's your advice for me? <sighs> My advice you for said you? I, I'm the French chase down, so I... <laughs> oh. Okay. First of all, yes. What's the name of your YouTube channel? Inspiration Juive. Jewish inspiration. Means, I, actually, yeah. I started I started an uh, English channel, but I didn't. Oh, really? I have like three videos in French in English. Wow, I didn't know that. Because I've seen some of your videos on your on your French channel, your main channel. Okay, yeah. so if anyone wants to see your videos on YouTube, probably the easiest way to go into YouTube and just write your name. Yeah. Uh, your yeah. Uh, yeah. No, not on YouTube. On YouTube, it's uh, yeah. I guess my name yeah, would work. They, yeah, yeah, my would name take, would work. Yeah. yeah. Why I started on H I R yeah E L B A Z E yeah exactly okay I started on TikTok really it's like really there's yeah TikTok was a new platform yeah I have a friend yeah who has a company uh, SEO company you know what mm -hmm. SEO is right Google search engine yeah. optimization yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> and he came over to me one day uh, after Mincha and he said yeah yeah you have to open a TikTok account. I just right. hired four people to take care of TikTok for my clients. Mm -hmm. I said, what's the what's the concept? He says, it's like Short videos minutes. under a minute. Right. I'm like, what am I going to tell people in a minute? Right. And and I had a show, Tanya, Igera Satchuva, you know, the, I think Perek Zain speaks about the two ways. Had a, you made a map on, on yeah, but not Igera Satchuva? No, no, just look no. at your bottom. So... Um, so I started, the first video was, uh, you know, sometimes you want to change and you can't keep it. You can keep the change for a long time. So you have to do two things. First of all, you have to have Achmanus on yourself. Achmanus, how do you say? Achmanus. Uh, pity. Pity compassion. on yourself. Yeah. Compassion about yourself. And the second way is uh, get rid of the, the ego. Because ego is edging God out. But you can't say that in French. So I didn't say it in French. Oh. Uh, now I said in French because you're here and I know it's your sentence. Yeah. I mean, I make it up. I got it from somewhere. Really? Yeah, oh. I didn't make up anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aye, aye, aye. Um, and then eventually I did the rest, you know, Instagram and uh, uh -huh. YouTube and um, and all of the rest. But it's uh, many things I, can, I, I take from you. If I start doing it in English, then people will tell. It's, right. uh, <laughs> I was looking, actually, I'm going to be teaching God willing, this sicha tonight at my Parsha class here in the Five Towns. But there's a sicha from Chelek Gimov Lakote Sichas, a Yud Shvat sicha, which is actually from the Fabrengen from Tavshin Yud Beis, yeah. meaning not the first, the second, but the second, yeah. So um, there, the Rebbe is speaking about how in the Targum of the Posik, uh, where it says the Jews left Egypt. Beyod Rama with a high hand, which is in, in Aramaic, Beresh Glei. Uh, the, Rashbi. Uh, right. So the Beresh is, is, is Rashbi. The letter is based on Reish Yod Shin, is Rashbi, Reb Shim Ben Yechai. Asi uh, Spiegel was he here. He spoke about it, he I remember. About, I right. it. And it's uh, Reb Yitzchuk Ben Shleimer, which is the, 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 the Arizal. And it's Yisrael, Reb Yisrael Baal Shem, or Reb Yisrael Ben Sara, which is the Baal Shem Tev. As well as the the Friedrich Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok ben Shtein Osara, or Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok ben uh, Shalom Debe. So, in that sikh, I was just looking at the sikh last night. He says that the Rebbe says that his father in law, the Friedrich Rebbe, took pains to disseminate this beyond those who even understood. Uh, Loshen Kodesh, or even those who spoke Yiddish. He says he even brought Chassidus out into, and he gives two examples. I, I was thinking about the fact you're coming by here, and he gives two examples. He says, of English and Französisch. That's the two languages he said. He said English and French. I thought it was very interesting, interesting. that those were the two examples, English and French. I mean, how much uh, French chassidus was published at that time in 1952 when the Rebbe said the sicha? Very little books. I think Rabbi Godetsky translated some at that time. 
I don't think he was even in France. In 1952, Tanya wasn't even in new, French. In no. English. In English. Ah, in English. Uh, yeah, Nissan Mandel's Tanya wasn't even out yet in 1952. You know that in French you have tons of content in uh, the Holy Ghost Kadesh is, is translated into French. It's, it's It doesn't exist in any other language. <laughs> It's, uh, oh, the whole Igris, the Rebbe's yeah. Igris. Yeah, the whole wow. thing. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. 32 volumes. Yeah. Wow, I did not know that. There's been an app. You can find, uh, you can find all, the, uh, all the Igris. On Lubavitch, on Lubavitch <laughs> that FR, you can find all the, the letters of the, the Rebbe's Rebbe letters. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I was speaking with Asi that translation isn't just the language. It's the... I'll use a French word. It's the cultural milieu. Can you understand when mm -hmm. I'm speaking English? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we say we have that word in English. In English, we say milieu. Milieu. Yeah. So you're pronouncing it correctly. Yeah. But that means it's not just translating word for word. Understanding the mentality. Mentality. The, yeah. The, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I translate every week. Every week I translate. You, you ever saw the the class from uh, Shluchim office? Jewish insights. Yeah, 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 sure. So I translated it in French. It's called Perspective Juive. And I was just Jewish like, perspective. When I came, yeah. When I came when I came here, uh -huh. I was I was by the oil and when I was uh, translate I was finishing the this week's class. Sending it in in time? Yeah, yeah. Not on time. Not on time. <laughs> okay. You did your best. Uh, I, I always do I always send it on Sunday this week. It was on on, <sighs> on Monday. But I, I was like discussing with someone how to translate some some sentence, but like in French, it's it's different than English and than Hebrew. And uh. can you give us one example, one example of something where you translated and and you saw, you're looking at the Hebrew, you're looking at the English, and you realize the French is different than both of them. Wow, I have to to think now about an example in which French is different than Hebrew. And I was telling someone the word "taka" in Yiddish. Yeah. It, 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 you're not able to translate it. Right. And even you know, even in English, yeah, it's very hard. It, it, yeah. it, it, you have so many words like that yeah. that, that, that you can try to translate them, but the, the idea is not going to... Right. Uh, <laughs> My brother told me, I'm, I'm reading the Kutu Diburim in, in Hebrew. So I told him, like, you're missing the whole... Uh, right, right, <laughs> right. Because the, the Kutu Diburim is the whole is, thing, is the Yiddish, yeah. 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 It's, it's very different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I by the way, I'm I'm a, a Spanish boy. So for me to learn when I, when I speak in English, all my uh, Hebrew words come out in uh, in uh, with an Ashkenazi accent because right. because I don't know because I was I, I first learned Yiddish in Brunois and then I learned Engl I, I learned English in Morristown and you're able to mix uh, Yiddish and English. Right. You're not able to to, to mix uh, Yiddish and French. At least I never, I, ne right. I never saw people doing right. it. Well, Yiddish and so. English are both Germanic languages. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's, so they have similar grammatical structures, and yeah, it's much easier to to smush them together. Yeah, come to think of it, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, there, there's like there's Yinglish, Yinglish, right? But you never hear of like in the beginning when I wouldn't know a word in English, I would use either Yiddish or, and you'd get or by. Hebrew. Yeah, people, yeah, uh, yeah. That was in the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many many words are different in in uh, like like I uh, I was uh, I had to translate hell, so I didn't know if enfer, which is the French word for hell, was something accepted in our culture. If that's a word we use for gehen, is gehen. Oh, you weren't is sure if it was appropriate. Yeah, so I went to look on Chabad.org in French. <laughs> <laughs> How did they? And then I couldn't find an article, so I went to another Jewish website. I don't remember which one. Uh -huh. Like uh, you know, if, uh, when you're translating, a, right. uh, today you have Google, so yeah. it's very helpful. You have even uh, Chat uh, GPT. You can, yeah. you can ask him to translate stuff. Did you hear my thing about Chat GPT and Sam Sapochnik? No. Oh, it's a video. I just posted it a few days ago. Okay. I, I asked Chat one. GPT if it knows what uh, the Dunning Kruger effect is. Dunning Kruger. Yeah, Dunning Kruger. Effect. I don't know what that is. Okay, it's basically a psychological phenomenon that people who have no clue what they're talking about are very confident that they know exactly what they're talking about, and the people who know a lot are very—they have like 
they're very insecure. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm not sure if I know what I'm talking about. So it's like that ir- ir- ironic thing. Like the, the dumb people are always so, you know, so confident. So I asked chat GPT if it knows what Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah, yeah. It gave me a nice answer. I said, do you know what the saying? Yes, I'm Sapochnik is, which is Russian. And it, it said, yeah, it means I'm a shoemaker. I said, I know how to translate. I said, do you know it as an idiom? So it said, no. So I said... Um, Maybe people who watch us don't know what that is. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll tell you what I told him. I said, there's a story, a Hasidic uh, story about... There was a pogrom and the, 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 the Cossacks came and they, they looted and they stole stuff. And afterwards, the Jews would go try to find their own items and buy it back. So this Jew walked into a non-Jewish uh, shoe store and he sees some tefillin on the work table. He says, how much can I buy that for? The tefillin. And... Uh, non-Jewish shoemaker says 100 ruble. So he says, that's, a, that's, that's crazy. You're going to charge me so much for something that's not even yours? And he got offended. He said, yes, I'm Sapochnik. I'm a shoemaker. Because I mean, he didn't know what it was. It's leather. He thought it was like shoe parts. Mm-hmm. So he's like all offended. You're telling me it's not mine? Of course it's mine. I'm a shoemaker. So in the Hasidic expression, yes, I'm Sapochnik. I'm a shoemaker means... A guy who has no idea what he's talking about, and he's so confident he knows exactly what he's talking about. So I asked ChatGPT, could you like compare Dunning-Kruger effect with Yasam Sapochnik? So it did a pretty good job. And it's like, um, so they're, it, it, it said it well. Like they're, they're both the cases where people don't know what they're talking about. They're pretending they know what they're talking about. I said, okay, but could you rewrite it? And use the story. Now, I didn't tell it the story. I just told it the meaning. Yasam Sapochnik idiomatically means a per, you know, uh, a, a displaced rewrite. confidence. Right. So I said, could you rewrite that answer, but use the story? So he, 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 he writes the story. And he's like, once upon a time, there was a man who went to a shoe store. And he said, could I get some shoes? And the shoe store man said, of course, Yasam Sapochnik, I'm a shoemaker. So I said, Chat GPT, that's not the story. You just made that up. And then I realized Chat GPT is a Sam Sapochnik. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was all confident. And that's the j- danger of Chat GPT, because he's so confident. He says stuff, it sounds so smooth, it's so believable. I asked him about political questions. I know, asked like, him, uh, by the way, Paolo Vufance, and he said, yeah. yeah. Where? Of course, he speaks French, yeah. of course. He of speaks course. everything. He even speaks Hebrew. Yeah, I, yeah he speaks Hebrew. I don't know Hebrew. if he speaks Yiddish, but... Uh, he, he doesn't, do, no, I, I tried Yiddish with him. I tried, I tried, <laughs> hablas espanol, I tried a few languages with him. He, yeah, no problem. You you but spoke to him in French? I spoke to him in French, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Spoke, I mean, you typed, yeah. yeah. So you asked him his politics. Yeah, I asked him about Israel, I asked him about, uh, I asked him about the Rebbe, I asked him about, uh, you know, the first question right. that Lubavitcher always asks uh, right. <laughs> someone to see if he's smart. Right. You know? Like, who's right, who's wrong, right. this and that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting. And he keeps getting better. Yeah. He's going to be a great mashpia in a few, yeah, in a few so years. Yeah, soon, in a few years, yeah. yeah. Just have to keep working on it. Uh, okay. Ay, ay, ay. I'm, I'm really glad you made it. Um, it's Very been a nice. long time coming, this encounter. To people who are watching, it's yeah. not as big as you're thinking. <laughs> this the, everyone who comes to this studio always says, it's so much smaller than it looks on, online. Yeah, anyways, uh, yeah, it is. But there's enough room. Yeah, a small place that contains, spiritually at least, a lot of good stuff, hopefully. Okay. Well, Thank very you. Nice Merci to be beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. And uh, au revoir. A bientôt. And uh, what's that? A bientôt is like, uh, see you soon. Yeah. Oh, like Lihitraot, kind of like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hasta yeah. luego. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. See, see oh, I, I guess in English we say, see you later. See you later. Maybe? Yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny. I was getting off a plane and, you know, the, the flight attendants have to stand there and they're like, you know, bye 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 bye. bye. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was walking. I was like, "See you later," and I was like, "No, I won't." <laughs> <laughs> I just said, see you later. I won't. I mean, an off chance, maybe I get the same crew, but rarely that happens. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, been a and pleasure.